Hi, everybody. Or as we say here at Seacliff State Beach, ahoy there. My name's Joseph. I work for California State Parks. There we go. And before we get into what we'll be doing over the next half hour, I like to let you know a little bit about the person you'll be spending the next half hour with. So I'm not just a state parks person with a great big beard. I am also a dad. I have a kid who's almost 14 years old. I have a junior ranger who's seven and a half years old, probably pretty close to your age. And I have a two and a half year old, a mini ranger, micro ranger, I guess. And we have been spending a lot of time together lately um, because, you know, one, especially, you know, happy summer. Today's the first day of summer, but the school year ended a little bit early, didn't it? Or at least it didn't end the way we thought it would. We've been spending a lot of time at home because of the coronavirus pandemic. And the safest thing we can do is make sure we give other people lots of space. We don't breathe on them and we stay home as much as we can. So when my family started staying at home, my medium kid, the one who's about your age, he said, dad, dad, he came to me, he's very excited. Dad, I saw a medium sized bird fly into a bush out by where we parked the cars. And he was very excited, so I thought I'd better go check this out. And we went out there and we found that a bird called a, it's a scrub jay. If you wanna look up scrub jays, we probably won't see them today. But um, the scrub jay had flown into a manzanita bush by our cars. And we started exploring and investigating, and we found that there was not one scrub jay, there were two scrub jays. There was a mom and a dad, they were making a nest, we found the nest, and we found, well, after a while, we tried to see the eggs, we couldn't quite see them. But what did we see? We saw the chicks after the eggs hatched. So we've got a bird family living right next door to our family. And that's what we'll spend the next maybe, oh, 20 minutes or so looking into. Birds at Sea Cliff. And here at Sea Cliff, birds survive in some surprising places. You know, we think of birds, maybe we think of birds in trees. Well, yeah, we've got trees, but our trees here might be a little unusual because we're a beach. And unless people plant trees at the beach, we don't have many trees here. And there's this funny thing out here. Oh my goodness. All the sand and the cliff, as um, some of you may have seen when we tuned in. So we will look at Habitats today, that's a word you probably heard. Habitats would be places where animals and plants and living things can make a home for themselves. Birds can be found in almost any habitat. There's some kind of bird almost anywhere and some kinds of birds can go almost anywhere if you catch my drift. We'll look at the habitats we have here including those kind of unusual ones. We'll look at the adaptations the things about those birds that help them live and do so well in those different habitats. And then we'll look at the one thing that makes birds different from any other living animals. So let's get a good look at our habitats. I'm sure you have a very good idea what I look like right now. So let's look out. Name of our state beach is Sea Cliff State Beach. And there's the sea. There's that cliff and those trees. Those again, those trees are only here because people planted them. Trees don't usually grow on the beach without our help. And there's this funny thing out here, which we'll get into later. Let's start with the sea part of sea cliff. There are some birds so well adapted, so their bodies are so ready to live in the ocean that they spend almost no time on land. And it's getting to be just about the time of year when we would expect to see them off of our beach out in the ocean out there. There are a lot of birds that spend a lot of time in the ocean, but I don't know if any bird spends more time in the ocean than the sooty shearwater. And even though it's a cloudy day, I'm afraid that our exhibit cases have got a lot of reflections on them. So I'm gonna move around a whole bunch and try to get you the best look at these animals. Here's a bird called the sooty shearwater. We'll turn it around again. So again, you know a little bit about me. Let's, uh, a little bit more about me. I'm about six feet tall and I'm almost two, I'm over 200 pounds. So I'm kind of a big guy. I'm standing right next to this bird. As birds go, that's pretty big. Um, that wingspan, so then from, kind of one end of the wing 
all the way to the end of the other wing. Where, where am I pointing here? There we go. <laughs> it's about as long as my leg, my, my big six foot guy, long leg there. That's a whole lot of wingspan for a bird. And there's almost no body to it. It looks kind of like a flying potato. <laughs> it's a little bigger than a, it'd be a big potato, but it, about potato size. The city shearwaters are just kind of made for life at sea. The only time they spend on land, hey bird, and remember, we don't kill any of our animals, but when animals are found dead, we take their bodies and preserve them so that we can share them with you. City shearwaters spend so much time in the ocean, they migrate, which is an adaptation. That means they move from place to place at different times of year. Today is the first day of summer. Happy summer to you. Happy summer, shearwaters. We'll be seeing you soon. In the summer, they fly from where they make their nest, the only places they spend any time on land. You see those red dots on our map there. Where's my finger? There it is. Red dots on the map. That's a country called New Zealand. That's across the Pacific Ocean the long way. Let's look out at our Pacific Ocean. Well, okay, let me know when you see New Zealand. It's somewhere out there past the ship. If you don't see it, you're not alone. I have never seen New Zealand because I have never gone there and you cannot see it from California. It's across the broadest part of the ocean, I think on the face of the planet. That's how far our friend, the Sooty Shearwater flies to join us every summer to feast on the bounties of Monterey Bay. They are fish eating birds. We're gonna talk about the adaptations that help them do that a little bit later. But first, just get a good look at this bird and think for yourself, how do they do it? The only time they spend on land, oh, there's me, hi. The only time these birds spend on land is uh, nesting and taking care of their eggs. Otherwise, they're flying and floating all the time, for all the rest of their lives. What? about their bodies and the way they behave? How have they adapted to spend almost their whole lives on the ocean? Think about that. Let's talk about how birds have learned to survive in other habitats or adapted to survive in other habitats. So we are called sea cliff, there's the cliff. And at the base of our cliff here, we've got some trees planted up in the neighborhoods up above, we have more trees planted. Oh, somebody forgot their coffee. So birds take advantage sometimes of the things we do. Oh, there's a bunch of birds right there. And they flew into the tree. Oh, imagine that. Almost like I planned it. But I didn't. Birds really are everywhere. More on that later. Let's meet some birds that like to use the cliff and the dry land up above it. That's part of our state beach, too. Do you see them? There we go. <laughs> These birds are called red-tailed hawks. Let me know if you can figure out why they're called red-tailed hawks. So think about the parts of their body and the way they behave and act. You can see them in action here. These birds were found this way. Sometimes people look at them and they think they're fighting. They're not fighting. That's a mom and a dad. That's mom over there, that's dad over there. With this kind of bird, the moms are usually a bit bigger than the dads. That is the gopher that one of them caught, I think it was the dad, to go home to feed their chicks in their nest. Sorry, gopher, rough time. Yeah, all three of them were found together like this and uh, they're preserved through a process called taxidermy so that we can keep telling their story. And we've been doing that for almost 30 years in this visitor center since I was junior ranger age. Oh my goodness. So the red tail hawk, think about how it's same, kind of the same and different compare and contrast with the sooty shearwater. I see again, big long wings, but broad wings and a bigger body with a big tail. I didn't even see the feet on the shearwater. Look at the feet on the red-tailed hawk. Wow. Let's think about how a bird like that might be adapted to survive up on dry land using the trees up on top of the cliff and at the bottom of the cliff. Then, hello again. <laughs> Let's look at perhaps the strangest habitat here at Sea Cliff. We'll have you take a look out the window. And look at that. 
So this structure was built by people. It's called a pier. And animals that like to live around people, we have a lot of them there. Um, so the people, um, like pigeons, like to live under the pier. So that's an adaptation too, being able to not, you know, not worry too much about what people do. Being able to eat people food. I think this right here is perhaps the most interesting habitat we have. And look who's flying out there all around it. All the black stuff on top of that thing. Every single little kind of blob you see there, that is a bird. There are more birds on that sunken, broken, rotten, stinking concrete ship from 101 years ago than anywhere else around here. So when we say birds are adaptable, birds are about as adaptable as people are. Anywhere you go on earth, there are probably some birds that live there and there are some birds that can go pretty much anywhere on earth and live a very happy life. So how do they do it? We're gonna look at their adaptations. These are the parts of birds, the things they do, the things they have that help them live in all their different habitats. There's that shear water over my shoulder again. So we were going to review some of those adaptations. The shearwater is a bird that lives on the open ocean. And it's got all the parts that a bird needs to have. Think about all the parts a bird needs to have to be a bird. There are some things that all birds have, and there are some things that only birds have. <laughs> but birds need a few different things. You can probably think of five or six of them to make them a bird. If you are thinking beak, you are absolutely correct. This is, I'm just not gonna, I'm not even gonna try to hide it. This is my favorite bird. This is the California brown pelican. Look at that beak. That beak, so here's my big old like bass player hand, right? Look at that. That's a big animal, even bigger wings than the shearwater and the red-tailed hawk. That beak is made of the same stuff as like horns and fingernails. There's keratin in there. And all birds have them, but not only birds. Who else has beaks? Turtles have beaks. Octopuses have beaks. Duck-billed platypuses have beaks. It's right there in that name. That word bill is the same thing as beak. Same thing. So look at that great big bill. And sometimes when you take a good look, you can figure out how they use it. Think about how does a pelican, maybe you'll see some other adaptations that tell you where this bird lives and how, or looking at the beak right now, how do they use that beak? If you didn't know, the pelican dives into the water with its mouth, its big, big mouth wide open, and it catches fish with that big old pouch. It's like a net almost with no holes in it. And they dive in and they scoop up fish, usually ones called anchovies or sometimes sardines, you know, whatever they can get, they're not that picky. And then they, one thing that birds do not have is teeth. <laughs> teeth, um, as it turns out, are kind of heavy. And for uh, animals that like to fly, and many birds do fly, they don't like to have any more weight than they need. So they got this big bill, big mouth, but no teeth. They have to swallow the fish whole. <laughs> Other birds that live in the same place may look very different and they'll have very different beaks. What do we have here? My oldest kid calls this one a butler bird. <laughs> if you see down in the corner, the um, official name is surf scoter because we see them in the surf and they're perfectly colored for um, Halloween. They come back pretty much every Halloween, every year. We see them over the winter starting in Halloween. Lives out there with the pelicans, but it's got a completely different bill. It's not that big. It's about the size of a duck. Here's my finger next to it. Not as big. So they're gonna use that bill to eat differently. How does this animal use its bill? There's a marbled godwit. The marbled talks about the color, which is something we'll get into later. Look at that. Those long legs, we'll talk about those too. They use their bill to dig into holes in the sand and in the mud. 
we've got the egrets the egret likes to stab animals very quickly look at how its neck is all twisted like that it just jabs its face into whatever it's trying to eat snacks it or snabs it well one more time spears it there we go spears a snack with that beautiful golden bill and then again swallows it whole because birds don't have teeth and here's the one we saw on the ship mostly it's called brown's cormorant if you look at that beak, different again. It's also a fish eater, but instead of using a net, it uses a hook. Another bird with a hook-like bill is the hawk, but you see it's not long and kind of delicate like that. It's short and thick and strong. And guess what they use that for? Sorry, gopher. They use it for tearing up meat into um, chunks that they can swallow. So birds have beaks. It's a nose and mouth all in one piece. But that's not all they have. What else makes birds birds? Did you notice that they have wings? All birds have wings. They might not all fly. But all birds have wings. Many of them use them to fly. <laughs> Did you notice that, so the wings are kind of like arms, and then birds have two legs like we do. So again, birds all have wings, but they're not the only animals that have wings. You can probably think of a few other animals that do. What about bats? What about bugs? And then, you know, lots of animals have two legs. Some animals stand on two legs most or all of the time. Humans stand on two legs most or all of the time. <laughs> birds stand on two legs most or all the time. Some birds, we almost never see their legs because they spend almost all their time floating. Some birds are all legs. Some birds have very special legs. How do you think they use these different legs? Can you imagine if you had stilts, how far out you could go in water and what you could see if you were up so high? The great egret uses its legs like stilts to wade out into ponds and sometimes into the ocean or marshlands. And then it can see down in the water and use that big deadly spear-like bill to grab whatever it's trying to eat. It's not a very good swimmer though. Cormorant can barely walk. But not only can it swim with these big old webbed paddle feet, it can dive. So they go underwater looking for fish. Birds are warm blooded. We talk a lot about how much birds eat. Lots of animals are warm blooded, including us. And that means you can stay active whenever you want, but it means you have to eat all the time to keep your body temperature up. So birds are always busy eating or fixing another part of their body or something like that. But they are very busy, they're warm-blooded. And then there's one thing that we haven't mentioned yet that might've been the first thing that you thought of, but it is the one thing that only birds have. When you think of birds, do you think of feathers? Well, as we said, there are other animals that walk on two legs, there are other animals with beaks, there are other animals that lay eggs in nests. There are other warm-blooded animals. But the only animals alive today with feathers are birds. And what do feathers do for you? For birds that fly, and that's a lot of them, you see there's different kinds. Those big, broad feathers help catch the air, and birds are very light. The ones that fly are. And so with a bit of pumping and soaring, they can use those to achieve liftoff and get up into the air. And then they can control themselves as they fly through the air. But not all feathers are for flying. Remember, some birds don't fly at all, even though they have, all have wings. Some feathers help a bird stay kind of warm. If you look, look at all those fuzzy ones around the legs. You ever have a down jacket or a down pillow and it's all soft and cozy? We don't use bird feathers for this as much these days, but that's where we got that idea was from birds. A nice downy, cozy pillow or 
quilt full of bird feathers would keep you very warm. Birds also use their feathers to stay dry. So here's an animal that spends almost all its time on the water. But look, you can, it's hard to pick one feather out from another. They keep the water off of their skin so that you know, this warm-blooded animal doesn't get cold on the water. Well, there is one bird who gets wet. <laughs> Most birds will use um, glands, parts of their bodies that make oil to cover their feathers to help with the waterproofing, not the cormorant. Remember the cormorant's a diver? If you cover your body with that oil, it means you're gonna have a hard time getting underwater and staying there. So the cormorant doesn't use a lot of oil on its feathers. It does sink into the water, it does get wet, and that means it has to warm up and dry off. And sometimes you will see they take their wings and they spread them out like dragons and they dry out. We see this on the ship in the pier all the time. Good to see you again. Hi, everybody. Oh, where'd we go? We're still here. Okay, good. So, whew. those feathers are really what set birds apart from all other living animals. So, let's take a moment to get to know feathers really well. Um, let's take some time to go find your pencils or your crayons and your paper and uh, make sure you've got a nice place ready where you can start drawing. We're going to do a scientific drawing of feathers. So while you're getting your stuff ready and finding a nice spot, there was one thing I wanted to share earlier that I knew I was going to forget. I'm going to try to show you. Do you remember um, how our, our birds were... Um, our city shearwaters come in groups of half a million. I wanted to show you what that looked like. So let's see. This was at the end of summer a couple of years ago, right here at Seacliff. It was almost 100 degrees down the beach. We might have thousands of people on our beach today. But as many visitors as we have here at Seacliff, if you follow the pier out to the old concrete SS Palo Alto, look at that. We might have oh, no. even more city shearwaters and they are visiting all the way from New Zealand that's across the Pacific Ocean the long way and we see them every summer but this is an impressive display hello again hope I didn't lose you <laughs> all right no more Q&A yet so we're gonna go back to the office this is where we do some of our behind the scenes work, but you get to come with us today. It's the office. <laughs> all right, so I've got my drawing space all set. I'm gonna twist you around a few different ways. I'm gonna go turn down my music, and you see we've got a feather right there. While I turn down my music, think about what kind of feather that might be and what kind of bird. All right, here's my fun hat for when I go outside. Look forward to seeing you outside someday soon. Well, we do, of course, we'll do it right if we're outside. We give each other plenty of space, and if we're ever anywhere near each other, we mask up. This is my special beard-friendly mask. <laughs> Can you see that I'm still smiling, even though you just see my eyes? Yep. <laughs> All right, so if you got your paper ready, your pencils ready, or your crayons, or your pens, if you're feeling very confident. Some people draw on charcoal. There's a lot of ways we can do this. But I'm going to try to draw this feather. Did you guess who it was? This feather we found on the beach here, and it came from one of those great big brown pelicans. This is one of their flight feathers off their wing. That's one of the biggest feathers you're going to find around here. And as I said, those birds are my favorite, so that's the one I picked for today. So to start a scientific drawing of a feather, you're gonna kind of approach it in a few different steps. I'll tell you what they are and then we'll try them. The first step is to draw the central spine, or rachis it's called. Every feather's got one, and they usually have a bit of a curve to them, and they're usually kind of more rounded on the end where they attach to the bird, and they come almost to a perfect little point, a needle point, at the far end, but between here and there, down feathers and flight feathers can be about as different from each other as feathers can be. And from one type of bird to another, they can be wildly different. 
But that's where we'll start is we'll draw the rachis, the central spine of the feather. The next step will be to draw the big shape of the feather. And if you're feeling like a really thorough artist today, maybe you just kind of sketch that lightly so that you can erase parts of it easily later. But if you just kind of draw the big shape, I mean, that's really what it's going to give people the idea of the feather. So you can just leave it there, too, if that's how you feel. There's a lot of good ways to do a scientific drawing. But once you've drawn the big shape, the next step is to fill in the little shapes. And some feathers, like a peacock feather, those are going to be really easy to see. I do have peacocks running around loose at my house sometimes. They're not mine, but sometimes they come visit. Um, Others, the shapes will be a little harder to see, but let's see if I make sure to get this white behind there, you'll see kind of notches where the feathers have little notches in them in places. They get thinner, they get thicker. Sometimes there's little parts off to the side, little fuzzy bits. You draw those smaller shapes within the great big shape. And then after that, you just kind of add color and detail until you feel like you're done. So for a scientific drawing, you do want it to be realistic, but in a way it's also what's called idealistic. You're not just trying to draw the one that's in front of you, you're trying to draw the ultimate uh, perfect in a way. Don't put a lot of pressure on yourself, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to make a feather that is gonna look like any other pelican feather that you might see. You look at your drawing and it's gonna have all the things a pelican feather needs to have. And so those scientific drawings, they do look realistic, but they are, you know, people make sure to include all the things that they need to have in them so they can use them to identify and compare to different types of birds and different kinds of feathers. So if you're ready to begin, let's remember, we're going to go step by step. The first thing to do is draw the rachis, this long central spine. Other feathers, it might not be very long. It almost always has a little bit of curve to it usually thicker on the end where it attaches to the bird and at a point at the far end. This one is very long. As you can see, it's almost as long as my hat is wide and my hat's pretty wide. So let's, oh, sorry about that. Better? Good, all right. Draw yourself a nice, big, slightly curved, thicker and rounded at one end, pointed at the other, a little tiny, sharp bend of this one. And then I see a kind of rounded and thicker up to about here. And it stays kind of thick through here in this curve. And then about where that uh, things start getting funnier it turns. I notice that's a color I'll add later. The central spine turns from white to black. And it gets really narrow and comes to a point here. So maybe I'll let myself know that I want that to be black later. The time for color is really later, but maybe I'll just give myself a little note. And then with this one, I don't know if you can see it. Maybe if you zoom in or something, there's a tiny little line here, kind of a circle around the feather. And I think that's this much of it sticks into the wing and the rest of it sticks out. So I'm going to add that a little bit there because that's part of our central spine. That's one of our smaller shapes. How'd you do? Here's my central spine or rachis. And I drew a lot as a kid, but I mostly drew from imagination. I didn't usually draw from uh, things that I found, you know, looking at them. And so I'm learning to do this too. And do you remember our next step? Our next step is to draw the overall shape, kind of the outline, you can think of it. And so what I see, you know, let me know if you see the same thing. I see that this feather is kind of thinner along the top edge, the way we have it set up now, thicker down below. There's this one little tuft over here that's apart from the rest of it. And then I do see a few bigger notches in the feather where these parts are coming apart. So coming off of that rachis, the um, central spine, are these little features called barbs, which is what we think of as the feathery things. Um, they're often kind of soft if you put your hand over them, but they can be kind of pokey or stiff. 
Um, if you put your finger directly into the end of it, it probably wouldn't hurt you, but you'd be like, ooh, not as fluffy as it looks. <laughs> so you have the barbs that come off, but you can really just draw them as a big shape because they stick together so much. And what makes them stick together are the microscopic things coming up off the barbs called barbules. You'll see birds when they're preening, taking care of their feathers. They spend a lot of time doing this. They spend a lot of time eating and a lot of time preening. They will take the parts where the feathers are coming apart and using their beaks, they'll put their feathers back together. And if a feather is too beat up, they'll pull it out. They can grow new ones. Um, but that's probably how we found this one is even though this one's nice, it seems to me like it's in pretty good shape. Pelican was just done with it and says, yeah, you know what? Don't need it. I'll grow more. <laughs> they have lots of feathers. So let's draw that bigger shape. So on that top edge, starting from a little bit beyond that circle there, I see it just starts to come away just a little bit. And then I notice about halfway along, it seems like it gets a little closer and then a little further from the rachis. It goes pretty thin almost to the end and then it widens a little bit and the, um, you know, this is maybe something that we'll do in our next step, but you see the uh, barbules have come apart and the barbs are separate. And it also broadens out a little bit, just a little bit at the end there. So I think I've got it. And then I'm gonna do the underneath part. That was wider and kind of stick straight, almost straight out from the rachis there, that central spine. And I notice it's a little wave here. So I'm gonna get a bit of that wave in there. It's almost like a eucalyptus leaf, the big old trees that we saw when we looked at the cliff where those birds flew into. That was a eucalyptus tree and the leaves on that kind of eucalyptus look a lot like this bird feather. And then there's that one other kind of major shape. It's not nearly as big as the other ones, but it seemed pretty important. On the same side as the um, wider part, kind of between that and that little circle, there's that tuft off to the side. I think I got it. All right, how'd you do on your big outline? This is how I did. And maybe you're looking at it and you're like, oh, I don't know, I'm not so happy with what I'm doing. I'm having some of that feeling right now. I'm like, you know what, this really, the actual feather is longer than the one I've drawn proportionally to the real thing. It's like, you know what, you can do this again. And again and again. That's how you get better at everything is keep trying. You're only going to get better. So don't get discouraged if your first scientific drawing of the feather isn't perfect. You know the steps. You just need to get the practice. And I'm getting some practice right now with you. Next thing to do, and I kind of think of this as the last step, although people that like scientific illustrators, people that do this for their job, they have a few other steps. But you fill in the smaller shapes. And again, on a peacock feather, they'd be really easy to spot eagle feathers, turkey feathers, they might be really easy to spot. On the pelican, it is kind of hard to see the shape, so I'll do my best to kind of show them to you. I see kind of a big gray shape there, but then the feather's black beyond here. Then I see it again, there's kind of like a gray half, and then a black half. And then on the tuft, there's kind of the edge right next to the rachis is white. And then it starts turning gray a little further away from it. So this is where you'll add those smaller shapes, you know, maybe the different notches, the places where the barbules have come apart. So you'll add your notches and your different colored sections. Let's see how you do. So again, I saw, let's see, about halfway up the length of the top side, I see. The gray kind of gives a little black. And so I'm going to kind of put a bit of a line there where I see the shift most easily. I'll do the same thing down below. And then I'm going to color or shade a little bit. I'm going to make that little bit at the end. I'm going to make it grayer away from the rachis and uh, whiter near the rachis, that central shaft. And then, let's see, our barbells look really good here. I'm gonna color them lightly. 
is there gray? I put a line where I see a nice break in the barbs. Another one there. And kind of shading and texturing and coloring all at once. And then that part, let's see. I noticed that maybe you can see this if I move around. The feather is more um, got little notches out of it on um, the end more than anywhere else. So I'm going to add a bunch of black. This already looks different from some of the ones I did when I was practicing for you. <laughs> did you know that we do that? We practice these things ahead of time. And I still forget things and I still say things differently than I would have preferred. It's all right. You know what? I've been doing junior ranger programs like this for almost 20 years. I'm still getting better at it. So I'm using my eraser a bit because I want to get those notches in at the end. And so I'm taking away from that big shape that I drew and adding notches. And then again, dark, 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 dark. Dark, 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 dark. <laughs> I love drawing, even though yeah, as a kid, I was, I was better at drawing things from imagination. I like drawing from reality, too. So I'm putting a lot of big dark lines on the top since that's so dark. And then less near that end of the shaft. I just want people to see barbules, but I want them to be lighter in color. Okay. So you're probably getting close to done now. If not, don't feel rushed. You can keep going after this. You know, take a screenshot, get a good look at that pelican, look at a pelican uh, feather image on a website. You, know, they can, you can find them. I'm gonna give you a really good website to go to before we're done. But how'd you do? There's my pelican feather. I don't know that it looks exactly like the one I was drawing from, but it sure looks like a pelican feather to me. So as a scientific drawing goes, it's a success. I bet yours is too. If you'd like for me to see them later, I would love for you to send them to me. A couple ways you can do that. You can send us a direct message on Instagram. We're called Seacliff State Beach there. You can send us a direct message on Facebook. We're called Seacliff State Beach there. Or if you want to send them directly to me, get a screenshot, that's me. You can. Send me actual mail if you wanted to send me a copy of yours to the street address down below. There's my email address down below. I love email. You can even call me if you want to talk about things later, and there's my number. So it sounds like we're done, and we're close, but not quite. <laughs> so let's go somewhere a bit more scenic than the office now that we're done here to wrap up. So walk with me, will you? <laughs> So long, Seacliff office. <laughs> and let's go see our bird friends again. I like this view. You remember this? That was fun. <laughs> it's been a good time. I've enjoyed hanging out with you, getting to know you all. Look at that. Ta -da. So today we've seen that the birds of sea cliff survive in some surprising places. So there's some unusual habitats here. There's the open ocean where we'd have a really hard time living. There's the dry environment up on the cliff, including the trees that people planted there. And the only reason there are trees is because people planted them there. And there's the ship. The big old rotten, bro broken, sunken, stinking concrete ship. And the reason it stinks is because it's covered in birds doing all the things that the birds do. Eating fish and, well, doing what comes after eating, right? So, we've seen how they live in those places, how they survive. They are adapted. Over many generations of birds, their bodies have changed. Some have great big wings for soaring across the ocean or for flying fast to catch gophers. Ah. <laughs> There's a lot of ways birds have adapted to survive in a lot of different places. And I want you to remember 
that feathers are a thing that make birds different from any other animal. The only other animals that we think ever had them were dinosaurs. And by some definitions, birds are the only living dinosaurs. Oh, <laughs> isn't that fun to think about? Look into that later. But the other thing I want you to know, there's a lot more fun stuff to do about birds from home. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen with you again. I wanna point you to the Bird Academy at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So if you can remember any of those words, all about birds, Bird Academy, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They're not the only good source for bird stuff, but they are a great source for bird stuff. And you can find an activity called All About Feathers, which is my very favorite um, thing that I've found to do here so far. So there's a lot more that you can do to learn about birds um, from home. But as much fun as the websites are, still trying to learn all this um, iPad stuff. We'll get there, we'll do this again. But I wanna let you know that from home, remember birds have adapted to live almost everywhere. Some birds can live in almost any place. And any place you go, there will be some birds. So even if you don't live out in the middle of nowhere like I do, with a bunch of bushes and nests and things like that, birds are gonna come to visit you wherever you live. If you're in an apartment in the middle of the city surrounded by concrete, you're still going to see birds. You can watch them feeding, you can watch them preening, you can learn all about whoever your bird neighbors are close to home. And you can do all that safely. Um, when you do head out, please remember, give other people lots of space. Wear a face covering if you ever get anywhere near anybody else. I don't think any of you have to worry about keeping your beard covered yet, but the day might come. So, you know, there's, there's one way to do it. But by the time any of you are growing uh, beards, hopefully we've put the need for social distancing behind us a bit. But my name is Joseph. I talked for a long time. I shared with you a little bit about my family and about our passion for birds in this place at Seacliff Beach. So I hope you can come visit us safely very soon. But look for more fun junior ranger things like this to you every Thursday and Saturday from here on out until well, it becomes easier to visit our actual parks in person. Thanks for coming out today. Send me mail and email and give me a call. Tune in next time. Bye.